you know, the sad story of Matthew Bellinger here on Think Tech Bigotry in America. We are joined by Max Samaroff, Stand With Us, which is an organization that does check out stories of bigotry. Welcome to the show, Max. Thanks, Jay, so much for having me on. Really appreciate it. Now, it's too bad that all the worst things bring us together. And this is one of those things. Um, he's arrested. He's at the Federal Detention Center, last I could see, in Honolulu. And he was stationed at Kaneohe Marine Corps um, Base here in Honolulu. Um, and uh, he's been written up a couple of times, but he's not really out there as national news, I would say. On the other hand, maybe he should be. This is a very sad story about a Marine. Um, can you can you give us a profile of this guy? Where does he fit in you know in in American bigotry? Yeah, that's that's a really interesting question. Uh, so first, just for folks who don't know, stand with us. We're an international education organization. Uh, we focus on fighting anti-Semitism and educating the public about Israel and the Middle East. Um, and so, you know, this story. It's, it's a story about anti-Semitism, bigotry against Jews, and also other forms of hatred and bigotry uh, on the far right. So this is someone who got involved with a neo-Nazi organization um, that was you know, focused on spreading some really, really extremist and disturbing uh, and dangerous ideas, um, much of it connected to, um, you know, fears of, uh, you know, minority groups in the United States uh, and a desire to turn the U.S. essentially into a white supremacist ethno state. Um, and so this is someone who was reportedly planning attacks against uh, the Jewish community, uh, planning attacks against other communities, planning to um, planning sexual assaults as part of uh, this white supremacist agenda. Um, and really clearly someone who um, just got taken in and radicalized by a lot of really, really bad and dangerous and hateful ideas that are out there in the world today. And, and unfortunately spreading faster than ever due to social media uh, and other factors um, that we have in our society. Sounds like a nutcase to me, but as you say, he's not alone. He's um, encouraged and motivated uh, and um, um, sort of launched by so many other organizations that would love to see him uh, execute his conspiracy. Um, can you talk about what his conspiracy, what his plan has been, and what got him landed up in an indictment? Well, uh, fr from what I read, um, he... He attempted to purchase firearms under false pretenses, uh, which is what got him actually, you know, picked up by law enforcement. Um, but but what they found was a trove of, you know, really really hateful extremist materials. Uh, once uh, you know they they searched his belongings uh, and and various plans and threats to, as I mentioned before, um, commit murder. Uh, against Jewish folks. I think he tar was, was focused on a specific synagogue, a Jewish house of worship. Um, and then also to uh, commit sexual assault uh, with the apparent purpose of um, impregnating uh, white women so that there would be more white babies born. I mean, this is, it's almost, as I'm saying it, it's even hard to really believe that someone had a plan like this and was trying to execute it. Um, but this was apparently uh, what this person wanted to do. Um, I don't believe that he was able to carry out um, any uh, of, of those horrific crimes. Um, and you know, in this case, that, that's fortunate. He was picked up before he was able to actually go through with any of this. Um, but we have seen, unfortunately, um, extremists along these lines, um, really terrorists along these lines, um, carry out uh, mass shootings targeting the Black community in Buffalo uh, not too long ago, uh, mass shooting targeting the Jewish community in Pittsburgh only a few years back. 
uh, mass shooting targeting the Latino community in El Paso. Um, you know, this is now part of a string of uh, white supremacist, uh, anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry driven um, violence and terrorism in this country. And it's certainly, you know, the far right is not the only source of hatred and extremism and violence whatsoever. Uh, in this case, uh, that's what we're talking about. Um, it's very disturbing. What's the, uh, you mentioned that it's through social media, and I guess there are common denominations among, you know, these massacres that you mentioned, and this guy, Matthew Bellinger. Um, but um, what are they? I mean, is there certain websites, certain organizations, a certain, mm, a certain mindset, maybe a certain use experience? Uh, and uh, I, I would ask you also, uh, what you know, what does this tell us about the military and particularly the Marines that a guy could have grown in this twisted direction while he was in the United States military? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, and really, I think we, we could probably spend hours talking about that, that, that quite, those questions alone. Um, so first, you know, I have someone in my family who was in the Marines. Um, I think that, you know, the vast, vast, vast majority of folks who make that sacrifice to serve in our military um, deserve all the respect um, and gratitude in the world. Um, at the same time, when you have an institution, an organization that, that's that large, um, it's especially in, in the world as it is today, I think it's inevitable um, that you're going to have a small percentage of folks uh, who are going to get taken in by some really bad ideas uh, that we have, uh, you know, spreading again on social media and in other ways in the world today. Um, you know, obviously there's an added level of concern um, with folks in the military, particularly, you know, in this case in the Marines, because it's not just someone who happens to believe in um, some hateful and extremist and violent ideologies. It's also someone who's presumably getting really high level military training and can, you know, put that violence into action in a, you know, much more horrific way than perhaps your average citizen could. Um, so I think there's an added level of concern for that reason. Um, but I, I don't, I don't necessarily, I don't know, I don't have any specific evidence to bring to the table that, you know, the radicalization or extremism level in the Marines is any higher than um, in some other part of society. Um, I just think the military training combined with the extremism is, is what the main concern is. Um, more generally speaking, um, there are, I think, many, many different factors that can lead people to adopt, um, you know, white supremacist ideas or other forms of, uh, you know, extremism and hate. Um, Something that tends to be a common denominator, um, though again, it's hard to completely generalize, is when people lack a, a positive sense of community, uh, when people lack a positive sense of meaning in their lives, when there's a void along those lines. And then these extremist groups, um, these you know, extremist figures, who can be very charismatic, um, paint the world in a, in a very black and white way, um, you know, and sort of tell people that they know who's responsible for the pain that they feel, um, and they have the answer um, to, to the problems in their lives. Um, that's when that vacuum can be filled by these really bad and dangerous ideas, um, like what happened in this case. Now, I'm speaking just about what you know, folks who have come out of uh, the white supremacist world and you know realized that um, you know they were wrong have talked about and you know the reasons they got taken in uh, by those ideas. I don't know the details of this person's life, how he grew, how he grew up, um, anything along those lines. I don't know his whole story. Um, I don't think that's public information at this point. Um, but that tends to be a huge part of it: that lack of community, that lack of meaning getting exploited uh, by people with really dangerous agendas. You know, you mentioned uh, we don't know his background. It, it hasn't been revealed. It, 
hasn't gone through either the what do you call it judicial process uh, or for that matter the, the media process we only know a couple three news stories uh, in secondary um i shouldn't say secondary but not the new york times and not the washington post kinds of um print 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 press um but you know I, and we could we couldn't look we couldn't find a picture of this guy and my question to you is it better to what's the word ignore them uh, you know i you notice uh, in some of the massacres around the country they don't spend a lot of time identifying the name of the individual or his background uh, they don't they don't give you anything to humanize him uh, and i think that's probably intentional it may be intentional in this case do we want to know more about him should the media tell us more about him do we want to know that his human story or would we like to not know that's an interesting question i i don't know that there's a completely clear-cut answer to it um i think that in at times on the contrary i think i've seen in certain cases the media uh, focus more on the perpetrators of these horrific crimes than on you know humanizing the victims and you know making you know making their deaths mean something positive ultimately um you know in in in, in whatever way that can occur despite you know their, their tragic deaths um there sometimes is a sort of obsessive desire to pick apart everything about um, the perpetrators, um, and and, and at, at times I think that that can be um, fairly distasteful and uncomfortable and counterproductive. Even at times it can feed um, the type of extremism and radical radicalization that happens, you know, online and, and in other ways, because you know you have these figures start getting so much attention. Um, they can be sort of framed as martyrs. For these extremist causes, um, and, and and you know, and held up as, as an example of someone who, through committing some sort of terrorist attack or or hateful act, um, they got so much more attention to um, the ideology that these extremist groups are trying to spread. Um, so there's certainly a danger uh, in uh, you know putting giving too much attention uh, to folks who perpetrate these types of crimes. Um, on the other hand, I do think it's important, at least for folks who are really focused on um, disrupting radicalization, disrupting hate, disrupting violence in our society, to understand as much as possible the details of how someone gets from point A to you know, being a violent extremist. Um, because it's, it's rarely just one thing. It's really just one factor that leads to that. It's usually multiple factors. Um, and if we want to disrupt uh, these uh, processes before they come to horrible conclusions, um, we need to attack it from multiple angles. You know, you mentioned, um, you know, this is kind of like uh, domestic terrorism, or maybe <laughs> international terrorism. It's, it's really that bad. But uh, query, you know, what is? Do you see it? Should we see it as terrorism, or should we see it as, um, you know, a a social and and a mental illness problem, or maybe both? Yeah, I I think it's I think it's a real mistake to um, to look at it as if it has to be either one or the other. Um, I think, uh, you know, again, I, I don't know all the background personal details about this individual. Um, but mental health problems can certainly be part of the picture and uh, hateful, violent extremist ideologies that lead to terrorist attacks can also be part of the picture. I mean, I'll give you a, a, a really specific and fairly recent example of that. Um, there was a guy, um, a British Muslim guy who came over to the United States um, a few months back. Um, I think it was uh, January, 2022. And he held um, Jews in a synagogue in Texas hostage. Um, and this is someone who had pretty serious mental health issues, but it was also someone who uh, basically supported 
in one way or another, um, a person who was who was and is in uh, an American prison uh, and was convicted for terrorism, uh, and during her trial was spouting blatantly hateful things about Jewish people. Um, and so, and, and this person apparently targeted the synagogue and held the people there hostage because he thought that some rabbi in New York was so powerful that she would be able to call the president of the United States or call whoever in the US government and free this convicted terrorist, right? So, so you have multiple factors here at the same time um, going into what I would argue was a terrorist attack holding people in a synagogue hostage for a political aim, freeing a convicted terrorist, um, mental health issues, hateful extremist ideas, and someone you know, sort of combining those two things and carrying out uh, this crime. Um, and, and those don't even have to be the only factors in a situation like this. There's probably even more on top of that. Um, so yeah, there's, there's no silver bullet and, and, uh, and it's rarely a black and white situation. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, not limited to um, killing Jewish people or uh, raping um, white women, uh, as in this guy's case. Um, we seem to have an increase in violence. Some of that is, uh, a good part of that is related to our Second Amendment problem. Um, the attack on Salman Rushdie in uh, West New York uh, just a few days ago did not involve guns, it was knives, but it was equally horrendous. And it, it was, uh, in my view, a terrorist attack. Um, we seem to have, Max, uh, an increase in this. You know, you and I, we speak in kind of a syncopated rhythm every year or two about something that's particularly disturbing. Uh, and here we are, and, and, and I bet if we, if we connected the dots from when you and I first met till now, we would find more violence, more hate, um, more, more, more disturbing things happening every time you look. Am I right? Because you're in the business of following this. You must have a sense of, of the, you know, the demographic on it. Yeah, well, you know, so if you look at uh, hate crimes in general, um, and I, I, the caveat here is that hate crime reporting um, is not comprehensive. Uh, so we don't know all the hate crimes that have happened in the United States. We only know the ones that have been reported. Um, but um, of those that have been reported, um, apparently, according to the FBI, um, it was either like 2020 or 2021 was a dramatic increase from the previous year. Um, and then if you look at anti-Semitism specifically, um, the ADL, which is the main organization that tracks anti-Semitic incidents from year to year, um, they, they just came out with their report on anti-Semitic incidents in 2021, uh, and it was a massive increase from the year before. Um, so yes, e even on a sort of large scale uh, statistical level, uh, we're seeing significant increases in hate crimes and hateful incidents um, in this kind of extremism and violence. Um, so it's very disturbing. Why? Where does it start out? I mean, in this guy, um, Bullinger, um, was heavily involved in neo-Nazi thinking. And in fact, uh, we haven't mentioned it yet, but, but a, a part of his initiative, his, his plan, uh, was called a Rape Krieg of uh, Blitzkrieg in Poland in 1939. Um, um, and that part of his plan involved uh, raping women so as to have more white women become pregnant. Um, so the country had, um, um, you know, more white women, I guess, uh, more white children. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's racist in the ultimate. And, and I guess the question is, does, does the neo-Nazism um, come first or does something else come first that invites the neo-Nazism? You know, you talked about the vulnerability of people's lot, people whose lives are empty. Um, what, what are the steps by which a guy like Matthew Bullinger reaches his level of madness? Um, is it ideological first, 
or is it psychological? I know this is a question I've kind of asked you, or is it psychological? What's the sequence of degradation? Well, uh, you know, uh, I think a, a fundamental truth is that no one is born hating anyone else. No one is born believing these kinds of extremist and violent ideologies like neo-Nazism or, or anything else. Um, these are bad ideas that are taught, that are spread. Um, and, you know, whether they take hold or not, um, that, that's something that depends on a variety of factors, um, which again, uh, can, can range from mental health issues to, you know, do, does this person have a positive sense of community and meaning in their lives? Do they have a support system of people around them um, who, you know, they can have conversations with and will tell them, hey, that's a really disturbing idea and here is why and educate them about those issues. I, I, could, I could probably go down an endless list of different factors that, that can enable these ideologies to spread. But then it's, then it's also the fact that um, you, have, you have these groups um, that are really actively going out and looking for um, vulnerable people. Um, people who can be exploited and brought into uh, these communities of hate, these communities of extremism, um, you've got not only those groups with that motivation, but you've also got um, this tool, um, social media, or, or even if it's not sort of, you know, mainstream social media, uh, various underground websites um, where they can radicalize people and find these people more effectively than ever. Um, and, you know, if someone is living a lot of their life online, uh, is, if someone is lacking, you know, a real life positive community or support system around them, um, then, you know, and on top of that, if someone has mental health issues, um, none of it is inevitable. I mean, people can, people still have agency, people still are responsible for their own decisions and actions. Um, but these are all, these are all factors that can lead people down these really, really dark paths. You know, the, you know, the, the Ray Krieg I mentioned was not necessarily Bullinger's idea. Uh, in fact, it wasn't, according to the reporting. Uh, there are, was, is an organization in the United States that, that calls for this, that calls for rape creed. And therefore, he's not alone. He finds comfort, he finds support in other organizations. This may not be the only one, but rape creed encourages him um, to, you know, to do what I mentioned, to rape white women in order to achieve uh, um, you know, uh, a, a, white, uh, a white supremacist country, as we discussed. So, so query. It seems to me that the organizations he finds and people like him find on social media and otherwise are actively um, seeking him. They're actively recruiting him. They're actively including him. Uh, we don't know who they are. I mean, a lot of that came out after the insurrection, where we found out that there, there was these militia organizations, very well organized and and funded and armed, for example. Um, and she was pretty scary to find it. But now this is this opens up the other possibility that there are even worse organ, even organizations that are even worse um, into hate and things like rape creed. And, and um, they're out there trying to recruit people. And he is the, you know, is the sad case of the guy who is who is somehow recruited into it. And I wonder how much we know about that. I wonder how much um, it happens and how much we can do about it. Yeah, I, so first, you know, th there have definitely been reports that these types of white supremacist organizations and neo-Nazi organizations will go out of their way to try to recruit uh, folks who are in the military and folks who are in law enforcement um, because, you know, as I mentioned before, these are some of the most, um, you know, highly trained in terms of, you know, uh, weaponry and, and military tax, tactics and, you know, any number of these types of skills that uh, these 
terrorist, essentially terrorist organizations would find useful to their cause. Um, so, so, so there's that factor, I think, and 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 that's really, I think, a matter for, um, a, a, in a huge way, a matter for the government, um, for law enforcement, for the military itself, um, to uh, take really whatever steps they need to take to um, to interrupt um, those recruitment efforts um, as early as possible. Um, obviously, you know, in this case, they were successful. They they caught this guy before he was able to carry anything out. Um, but you know, if if the community around a person, if the person's family, um, if if the you know society, if the education system, if all these different systems that we have um, aren't able to uh, convince a person that whatever toxic, hateful, dangerous ideas they're ingesting online or wherever it is. Um, are wrong um, and are are you know are are basically um, you know leading them down a path of just personal failure and destruction. If everyone else can't manage to stop these you know stop these processes in their tracks, then ultimately it, it falls to law enforcement and falls to um, you know in, in the case of you know the military uh, folks in the military to track track folks who are being radicalized and stop them and get them out of these institutions. Uh, you know, I, so. I recall in one of those uh, articles, there was uh, something about how he had an assault rifle um, and uh, he had obtained it from somebody in law enforcement with the help of somebody in law enforcement. And uh, that that is very chilling also. I, I, my recollection is it was like somebody in the FBI helped him. Now that might have been, uh, you know, a, a, an entrapment situation, or the way they found him, uh, the way they, you know, set him up, uh, maybe for the investigation. But I it may that's not what the have been. Said. Right. You think so? Okay. Um, the other thing is uh, when I know that just a few miles from where we sit, uh, that a guy is in the federal detention center, um, and a guy like this in the federal detention center, this. You know, it's it's not as if he's going to change his mind. It's the way he is. I mean, I don't know how you fix what's wrong in him, um, but that is very uh, frightening to anyone near him, anyone who thinks he might be on the street. I don't know what he looks like. Not a lot of photographs of him out there, um, but theoretically, he could be the next guy you walk by on the sidewalk. And um, he's a very dangerous item. And I am relying. Talk about law enforcement. I, the, the obligation, the, the expectation, law enforcement will find him, and, you know, cut him out of that recruiting plan, um, and and put him away because he's so dangerous. But we rely on law enforcement to find him and cut him out of the plan and put him away because we cannot afford to have him among us. He's a devoted terrorist, in my view, and in my view, I would put him away for a long time keep him away from me, to keep him away from my family, keep him away from everybody I know, because he's a dangerous, uh, explosive individual. Uh, you know what he will do if given the chance. Is our law enforcement system, is our investigation system as it exists today, adequate to deal with a guy like this who's really unhinged? Uh, is it uh, adequate to keep him away from me? Well, you know, in this case, they they found him, they got him before he was able to do anything, you know, do anything much more horrific and destructive. Um, so in this case, it looks like yes, but um, in a bigger picture, um, you know, I, I don't know that I have a clear answer. All I can say is I hope so. Um, but also, I, you know, I think by the time it, it, it falls to law enforcement, um, that's really the last resort. Um, I think we we ultimately need to do a lot more work um, much, much earlier on, um, you know, more at the beginning of when these processes of extremism and ra radicalization start. Um, and, and, and I think part of it is um, really a matter of being open 
to educating other people, uh, to having, having uncomfortable conversations with people who have, are starting to be taken in by these bad ideas, not assuming that they're inherently and forever bad and can't change, um, but rather at, at least at the beginning, giving them a benefit of the doubt that if you have an open um, and gracious conversation with someone um, and, and don't assume the worst about them, that you can, you can change their mind um, about you know, whatever extremist, hateful, violent ideas they may be hearing from online or wherever it is. Um, so it starts with a lot more efforts to do that with people on, a, on an individual and, 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 and community basis. Um, and when that fails, um, law enforcement is the last resort. Um, and, and we can only hope that they're up to that task. You know, in the Indiana um, incident uh, just a couple of weeks ago, um, the, uh, the attacker was shot by a bystander who had his own gun. And, you know, it falls within uh, Ted Cruz's suggestion that we all ought to be armed. Um, and there are those people, um, you know, maybe like Meyer Kahani back years ago, who would say, respond in violence, uh, respond and be ready to shoot them on the street. Um, this happens in Israel. There are people in Israel, I mean, a couple of days ago, there was somebody in Israel who had a gun and stopped the terrorist that way. Um, query, what, what are your thoughts about that? What are your thoughts about the, the Ted Cruz, the Second Amendment approach um, to this to protect yourself and others? Well, uh, I think it's really, really important for folks to understand that um, the situation with, uh, with gun laws uh, in Israel versus the United States is dramatically different. Yes, there are folks um, who, on the street um, in Israel who may be carrying and may be able to stop uh, a terrorist attack in progress, um, but there are far more regulations um, around who can carry a weapon and when. Um, and, and what kind of training they have to have and what kind of licenses they have to have. Um, you also have a country where, you know, people are, you know, largely required to go to the military. And so they have training in how to use firearms uh, safely. Um, so, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't draw such direct comparisons between the situation over there and our situation in the United States. Um, I think. I, it, it's it's hard for me to say um, whether what works in Israel would work over here. We're just very different places. Well, I wouldn't. I only raise it for discussion. I want to be clear, Max. I don't believe in it. I don't believe in Ted Cruz, and I don't believe in uh, the twisted interpretation of the Second Amendment that we have from our uh, esteemed Supreme Court. Uh, I think it only increases uh, violence. So. What can, aside from the things you've mentioned, what can I do to protect myself? What can stand with us to uh, to help me do that? Because, I, you know, this isn't going to end anytime soon. This is where we are. And, and uh, you know, whatever factors have, have been included, I mean, some people think that Trump is responsible for a lot of this. Um, some people think that um, violent movies are responsible for a lot of it, to fill that, fill that psychological vacuum in some people, um, what, what can we do? What can, how should I see this? Because it's almost like, um, you know, you could meet a, a Boulanger any day, Boulanger any day, and, uh, and, and, and have a bad day. Um, how do you avoid that, if at all? Well, you know, I mentioned we're an education organization. So, you know, well, Education isn't the only answer to a problem like this, but for us, it, it's the one we focus on. Uh, we focus on educating people of all ages um, about anti-Semitism, about the Jewish people. Um, there's many, of course, organizations that um, do education work regarding other forms of bigotry um, that, um, that were involved in this particular crime. Um, so, um, so for us, the priority and, and really, you know, one of the ways we attack the root of this issue um, is by educating people, uh, by countering bad ideas with good ones. 
um, both, you know, whether it's in the education system, on social media, anywhere that people get their information, um, we need to counter bad ideas with good ones. Um, that is something that anyone anywhere can do. Um, and, and it's not just in a sort of general abstract way, um, you know, sort of shouting things into the void. It's, it's the people you know, it's the people around you, it's the people in your community. You never know um, who may be struggling, um, you know, who may be spending a lot of time taking in a lot of bad ideas online or, or, or somewhere else. Um, all of us can, I think, do more to just reach out to each other, communicate with each other, have conversations with each other um, about, you know, any number of the things going on in our society um, in a way that's much more gracious and tolerant um, and forward thinking than, you know, the hate and extremism and violence that's only going to take our society backwards. Yes. What about the Simon Weisenthal approach, you know? I mean, not to say that we should go out of our way hunting Nazis, but um, suppose we run into one. Suppose we try to have a, a genteel conversation with somebody and we find that, oh my God, this, this fellow is off the side and uh, I can't reason with him. I can't uh, soften his feelings in any way. I can't change his mind. He, he needs to be investigated. Um, what are your thoughts about turning him in or reporting him in some way? Well, um, you know, A, I, I think if, if you think that, you know, someone is, if you, if you hear someone specifically threatening violence, um, then absolutely I recommend uh, calling law enforcement, making them aware. Um, I, I also think that basically it's rare that one conversation with someone who has extremist ideas is going to turn them around. Um, it tends to be from, from the folks who have come out of extremist movements, um, from extremist groups, um, you know, they may have had like a, a single thing that started their process of leaving, um, but it's rarely just, just one interaction. Um, so yes, if someone is threatening violence or, or implying it in any way, um, law enforcement should be aware. Um, but also, um, it can be worthwhile to uh, have some patience, have some persistence, um, and and have more than one interaction with someone and try to bring them out of the dark side. Yeah, not to get overly Star Wars on everyone. <laughs> well, thank you, Max. Max uh, Samarov, stand with us. Um, very important organization and very important work he does, and um, we we are greatly indebted to him for the work he does, the research he does, the education, public education, including coming on Think Tech to discuss these matters. Thank you so much, Max. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, everyone. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.